Okay, so why do we have to do really this renal function test? Is there any um, renal function test? To? To check what? To t check the renal functions. Okay, any other specific reason we want to do? Glomerular filtration. Okay, glomerular functions or filtration? Function, the functions of the glomerulus. Okay, anything else you want to do? Does it test only the glomerular functions or anything else also? Tubular functions, okay. So now you're telling me what is the function of the glomerulus and what is the function of the tubules? So filtration is a function of? It's very good. And what is the function of the tubules? Tubular secretion and tubular reabsorption. So that is the reason we actually do these renal function tests. Good, okay. So with this introduction, we move on. So as urine formation, the primary function of the kidney is achieved by two principal mechanisms. The first mechanism is glomerular ultrafiltration. And number two is actually going to be tubular reabsorption and secretion. So these are the two main functions, renal function tests, which we will be doing. So these are the two principal mechanisms. That is glomerular filtration and tubular reabsorption and secretion. So how do we classify function tests? So this can come as a viva question. So they can ask you, name the renal function test which you know of. So broadly, we can classify them as glomerular function test and tubular function test. So under the glomerular function test, we have these tests. You have certain blood tests which you can do to test your kidney functions. And of course, you can also do some direct uh, urine function tests also. So what are these things? So blood urea uh, estimation, blood creatinine estimation. Then we have something called clearance test, which we will further slides. We have something called as the inulin clearance test. We have creatinine clearance test, urea clearance test, and pH, that is para amino hippuric acid clearance test. And the last one is estimation of proteins in the urine. So these are some of the tests which you can do to test if the glomerulus is functioning well or not. On the other side, we have the tubular function test because we know the function of tubule is actually dilution and concentration of urine. So basically secretion action. So we have the urine concentration test, urine dilution test, test for acidification of urine, test for alkalinization of urine, and detection of uric acid excretion. So these are the tubular function test. So broadly, we are classifying them as glomerular function test and tubular function test. So this can come as a viva question to you. You just have to remember at least two to three tests under each of these categories. Clear? Is it done? All right. Can I move on to the next slide? Yes. Now we move on to the first test that is routine urine analysis. So when we say routine urine analysis, so even when you start your internship, some of the investigations you will write as routine blood investigations, routine urine investigations, etc. So when it comes to routine urine investigations, you will have certain things which will be done under this heading called routine urine investigation. So what all will routine urine analysis. The first one is the physical characteristics of urine. So under the physical characteristics of urine, we are going to see first about the volume of urine. So what is the normal volume of urine which is excreted per day? 1 to 1.5 liters per day. So there are certain conditions which can cause increased urine volume for the patient and there are certain conditions which can decrease the volume, urine volume or the urine output for the patient. So what are conditions will increase? Excess water intake which is actually very physiological the patient is on diuretic therapy. By now, you know what are diuretics. What are diuretics? Diuretics are basically agents or drugs which will increase the amount of urine excretion or water excretion in the urine. So you have the diuretic therapy. Diabetes mellitus, yes or no? Why in diabetes mellitus we have increased urine output? What type of diuresis is it? Osmotic diuresis, very good. So we have di uh, diabetes mellitus, diabetes insipidus, this diabetes insipidus, we have increased urine output. What is deficient in diabetes insipidus? ADH is actually deficient. So what's the function of ADH? Water reabsorption. So when that water reabsorption is not happening, naturally there's going to be increased water excretion in the urine and therefore diabetes insipidus. Or chronic renal disease itself. The patient is having chronic renal disease. His kidney is not able to do the function of reabsorption. So therefore there's increased urine output. The opposite will be decreased urine output. So decreased urine volume can occur with excess. It can be because of dehydration, profuse sweating, where there's a lot of water loss from the body, 
hypotension, hypovolemia, shock, kidney diseases again, antidiuretic therapy, and finally edema due to various reasons. It could be cardiac cause, it could be, you know, liver cause, any cause which is actually causing edema can actually cause the decreased urine output for the patients. Clear? Can I move on to the next slide? Yes? All right. Now you will come across two terms which Viva questions can ask. What is oliguria? What is anuria? So oliguria means when the urine output is around 300 to 500 ml per day. If it is even less than this, we call that condition as oliguria. What's the normal urine output? 1 to 1.5 liters per day. When it decreases less than 300 to 500 ml per day, we call that condition as oliguria. And if it is even less than 50 ml per day or totally absent, then we call that condition as anuria. Okay, so these are two viva questions which you can expect. What is oliguria and what is anuria? Now, what is oliguria and anuria? We have already seen there can be because of decreased urine production. The production itself can be less. The urine formation itself can be less. That can be because of the renal failure per se. The kidneys are not able to produce urine and concentrate and dilute the urine appropriately. So it can be something to do with production or Production can be normal, but the output has some problem. So the output problem can be at the level of, you know, the ureter, where there is a stone sitting in the ureter and obstructing the urine outflow. Or could be a prostatic enlargement, which is actually compressing the ureter or the urethra, and then it is not allowing the urethra to excrete the urine. Or it could be an atonic bladder, a problem at the bladder level, and the bladder is not able to contract and excrete the urine. Or it could be urethral strictures, the strictures in the urine, I mean, sorry, in the urethra, which are actually not allowing the urine to be excreted. So either the product of, of uh, I mean, the problem can be at the level of production of urine, or it could be at the level of excretion of urine. So that is about the volume of urine. So this is it. So here, you, what, what can you see here? There's a white structure which is sitting here. So that is actually a urethral calculi. It's a stone. It's a stone which is actually present in the ureter. Here you see this is actually the normal prostate and this is actually the enlarged prostate. And you can see that this enlarged prostate is in fact compressing. What is it? This is the urethra. So it is actually compressing the urethra and therefore the urine excretion will be at problem. And this can be a at the level of the bladder or it could be a problem at the level of the kidney itself. Clear? So this is about volume of urine. So the next term is polyuria. So we have seen what is oliguria, we have seen what is anuria and now we see what is polyuria. Polyuria refers to excretion of urine more than 3 liters per day. So if the excretion of urine is more than 3 liters per day, we call it as polyuria. Can you give some reasons for polyuria? Diabetes mellitus habits heavy heavy drinking okay increased drinking heavy drinking means what heavy drinking means what i don't understand more alcohol alcohol also causes increased urine excretion huh? oh ho. okay then coffee drinking okay coffee drinking excessive coffee intake caffeine intake yes anything else diuretic therapy very good Okay, any other reason? Yes? Huh? Any other reason? Cold climate, very good. Okay. Ah, what's the reply from that side? So she forgot that answer. Okay, anything else? Okay, we will see what are the causes for polyuria. So as you all rightly pointed out, it can be excessive fluid intake. It can be osmotic diuresis, as in the case of diabetes mellitus, it is hyperglycemia. It could be a neuroinsipidus or it could be a nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, diuretic therapy, psychogenic polydipsia, and increased frequency of micturition, as in the case of some urine infections, like this titis or it could be a urethritis, etc. So where there can be often uh, inflammation and irritation of the urinary tract, and that can actually cause polydipsia, poly, uh, poly, sorry, polyuria. What is the psychogenic polydipsia? Keep drinking water. Now that has become a very big fashion, isn't it? Little bottles now. How many of you carry this two little bottles? Especially girls, I think, should be carrying that. They say it's a weight loss regime, isn't it? You have to drink at least two liters of water per day. And now the two liter bottles are available. So you have to finish one liter in the morning and one liter in the evening. Isn't it? So that is actually called psychogenic polydipsia. So they basically they say that you drink water only when you feel thirsty. 
so you shouldn't force your body to drink water right so when this happens because just because you have to drink then we question actually as psychogenic polydipsia right now what do you think this could be what is this picture depicting what is that what is this picture depicting nocturia yes so what is nocturia so waking up in the night frequently and to avoid urine that is actually called as nocturia so what are the reasons for nocturia again polyuria just before going to bed you drink a lot of water then that itself can actually cause nocturia uretics chronic renal diseases and sleep disturbances this can actually cause nocturia clear yes so this is about the volume of urine which we have seen so far so the next thing we will move on to color of urine so any doubts in volume of urine what's the normal uh, urine output 1 to 1.5 liters per day so when do we call it as oliguria 300 to 500 ml per day or it could be even less than that what is anuria less than 50 ml per day or some completely absent also what is polyuria then 3 liters per day clear and we know what are the reasons for this disease conditions right So now we move on to the color of urine. So now when we see routine urine analysis, the first thing they will look for is actually the volume of urine, and the second thing they will look for is actually the color of urine. So the appearance of urine is usually clear. Okay. So sometimes the appearance of urine can actually be changed. So what are the conditions which can cause this change? So urine can appear turbid if it contains more phosphates, presence of pus in the urine. or it could be presence of chyle in the urine so chyle is basically because of the lymphatic obstruction so presence of phosphates or pus or chyle in the urine can actually change the color of urine so that is actually but generally the urine is actually clear in appearance coming to the order of urine so the order of urine is actually mildly aromatic because it contains volatile organic acids but diabetic you have a acidotic fruity order not the normal fruity which we think okay so it can have a acidotic fruity order so that is in diabetes mellitus all right so now we come to the different colors of urine so normally the color of urine is actually straw colored okay so this is a straw colored or we call it as amber yellow pigmented uh, urine which is actually because of the presence of the pigment called urochrome okay so So the urine is because of the presence of the pigment called urochrome. Now, yellow colored urine is actually seen in jaundice. We all know that, isn't it? Because of the excretion of bilirubin in the urine. So because of bilirubinuria. Any other condition? What is this urine? Black color. Any condition which can cause black colored urine? Alkaptonuria. Very good. The last one. Red color. Hematuria. Okay. So what all can cause hematuria? or any infections etc can actually cause red colored urine good so the dark colored urine is actually seen in alkaptonuria also seen in melanuria and red color urine is actually condition called hematuria or it can also be hemoglobinuria myoglobinuria or there's a drug called rifampicin have you heard this drug rifampicin yes or no in which condition is it given tuberculosis yes so in fact when it is actually given as a tuberculosis regime they be in fact I direct the patient saying that when you take this drug, your urine will be red in color, so don't be worried about it. Okay. Otherwise, when patient takes the drug and he sees red color urine, then he gets scared. He becomes very anxious, isn't it? So beforehand, we always actually instruct the patient saying that when you take this particular drug, your urine may be red in color because of this drug, so you don't have to worry about it. Okay. So this is one drug which can actually cause red colored urine. All right. Coming to specific gravity. So this is the third characteristic, the physical character. urine when you do the routine urine analysis so the specific gravity of urine can range from 1.005 to 1.030 but usually we actually remember as 1010 isn't it so 1.010 so this is what we actually remember as and this 1.010 actually corresponds to a urine osmolality of 285 to 290 milli osmoles per kg so it it, it will be of that range okay so this is actually the normal urine specific gravity and sorry urine so when all will the specific gravity increase and when all will the specific gravity decrease so decrease specific gravity means that means the urine is actually very much diluted 
Okay, so a dilute urine will have decreased specific gravity and of course that condition will actually be seen in diabetes insipidus. What about diabetes mellitus? What will be the specific gravity of urine? It will? In diabetes mellitus, what will be the specific gravity of urine? Decrease, huh? Decrease or increase? Okay, let me put it this way. What will be the osmolality of urine? It will be higher, okay? So, decreased urine uh, specific gravity is seen in diabetes insipidus and increased urine specific, uh, specific gravity is actually seen in dehydration. All right. Now, we move on to the biochemical characteristics of urine. So, this is a very important viva question. What is the normal pH of urine? pH of blood? 7.3 to 7 point. Okay, right. 7.4 we say. So, the average pH of urine is around 6, but this can range from 4.5 to 7.5. So, when all will the urine be alkaline in nature? So, when you take normal meals, immediately after meals, when we pass urine, so the urine will be slightly alkaline in nature. A meal rich in vegetables, again, can cause alkaline urine. Urinary tract infection and drugs like acetazolamide can actually cause alkaline urine. If you take a meal which is rich in proteins like meat and non veg then this can actually produce this acidic urine. Okay. So, this is about the urine characteristics with respect to pH of urine. So, any doubt so far? So, we have seen volume. Then we have seen about the color. And then we saw about the specific gravity and pH. And now, we move on to the next one. Clear for you? Yes? Can all of you wake up? Last row benches. Deep sleep. That is REM sleep or non-REM sleep? Non-REM sleep or REM sleep? Non-REM sleep. Which stage? How many stages are there? Four stages. Which stage of non-REM sleep? Three. Three. In which stage are memories memorized? Sorry, dreams memorized? Stage 4 or REM sleep? Yes? REM sleep? Okay, please get up, all of you. All of you are very sleepy after your uh, embryo class. Thinking about your own embryos, eh? how you originated and all those things. Huh? Huh? Stretch a little bit. Stretch, hands up, stretch, 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 stretch. Where is Bharat? Bharat, come to the stage, brother. Bharat, come, come. come to the stage. Now we will see Bharat doing yoga and meditation. Come, Bharat. Vada, vada. Okay, so we're going to just see what he's going to do. So Bharat is going to do some basic stretches now. Yes, Bharat. Ah, you know, no, no, you do, do it, do it. You attended yoga foundation class, isn't it? <laughs> okay, do some stretches. Raise your hands. Ah, raise, 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 raise. Raise your toes. Ah, leg, toes, okay, leg. Raise, raise. What raise means? What is he doing? Huh? Okay, turn to the side. Turn to this side. This side. Uh. Okay, fine. Thank you. Hey, why you people are sleeping? Huh? Go, 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 go. Chuma. Mm. Very sad. Sit, sit, sit. And drink some water if you want. Psychogenic polydips, yeah, sure. See, immediate effect, short of memory. <laughs> you have your connaissance coming, right? So you're going to enjoy those five days, right? Yes or no? Aye. But that is postponed, right? No, I, I, I don't know.
What Bharat? Bharat is giving some request. What Bharat? IA should get postponed. Will it get postponed? Can I ask the dean and then tell you? <laughs> no, I don't know. I just heard. I am not sure about it. I am not 100% sure. Maybe. I am not sure. But when is your uh, IA? I think you may have your practicals, but your theory may get postponed. So, I think so. I'm I'm not sure about it. But that's okay, right? At least theory, you get some time. You get that some five days, no? Of connaissance, uh, this thing gap at least. But I heard you have to do a lot of work for connaissance, right? A lot of in committees and all those things. How many of you have already volunteered for many committees? Is it volunteering or coercion? Coercion. Volunteering also, right? So that means you want to learn something out of that, right? So then you should enjoy your volunteering, that thing. Yeah, naturally you volunteered. So you learn something from that committee. See your seniors, how they work. So tomorrow you are going to become seniors. So you have to teach your juniors in that case. So that's how. So how many of you are participating in connaissance as participants? Presenting something? A lot of scientific programs going on, isn't it? You've joined some workshops. Ah, yesterday I saw that uh, ALS. Attending that ALS and BLS workshops? Hey, what is there in IA? But you don't get a certificate, isn't this a time where you can really learn something and you get a certificate out of it? I think you should use the maximum use of these workshops which are being conducted. You'll not get this hands-on training, especially the this an uh, association of uh, basic life life support so it's good you attend this workshop so i highly recommend that you all attend the workshop and then gain your knowledge right okay right so moving on to biochemical characteristic of urine so now we move on to proteins in urine so if you detect proteins in urine so it is actually not good because normally proteins are not filtered by the glomerulus so the normally the glomerulus is not permeable to substances especially to those which are actually more than 69000 daltons that is why we say normally proteins are actually absent in urine and the normal protein content should be less than 0.03 grams so if at all it is being excreted we have something called PC ratio, that's called as a protein creatinine ratio, which you will see again in the lab reports once you become interns and then once you start your, you know, entering into clinical rounds and all the things in your second year. You can see these lab reports which also say protein creatinine ratio. So the normally the protein creatinine ratio should be less than 2.5 and in females it should be less than 3.5. So more than 3.5, you call that condition as microalbuminuria. And more than 15, we call that condition as proteinuria. Okay. So normally proteins are actually not excreted in urine. Please remember that. Then this table, of course, you all must be knowing because in biochemistry, you would have done almost all these tests. Isn't it? Yes or no? Just go through these tests. You've seen all, you've done some of them. What all tests you have done already? Benedict's test you'd have done. Richard's test. Okay. Rotharas you have done? Yes. Okay. Gerard's you have done? No, no. Okay. Hayes test? Definitely you would have done. Okay. Vandenberg's? No. Okay. Pouchet's test. Okay. Right. Okay. So then anything? The last one, sulfosalicylic acid test. Great. Great. So then you have done almost all these tests. So hands-on training is available. So great experts, so I, I don't think I have to explain all these things, right? So we move on to the next condition called Benz-Jones proteinuria. Again, an important Viva question and an MCQ. Dave, close your mobiles. Right from the beginning, fidgeting with your mobile. Hmm? I thought, okay, you will finish off five minutes. And it's almost 40 minutes now since I started the class. Fidgeting and giggling with your mobile phones. Next time, your mobile phone will be outside the classroom. All right. So what is Benz-Jones proteinuria? So Benz-Jones protein is basically a protein which is an immunoglobulin light chain protein. And if this protein is being detected in urine, we call that condition called multiple myeloma. Okay. It's a malignancy. And this will 
if respect this malignancy you do this urine test and this urine test will actually detect one particular protein which is very specific for this malignancy that's actually called benstones protein in the urine indicative of multiple myeloma viva question for you now we move on to the last topic for today that is clearance test so clearance means what so how much volume of blood or plasma is being cleared of a particular substance that is actually called as clearance as simple as that so if you have certain volume of blood or plasma you suspect a particular substance to be present in that so how much volume of blood or plasma is cleared of that particular substance we call that as clearance test and it is usually expressed as ml per minute and these clearance tests basically will determine the glomerular functions actually so clearance can be calculated with a formula called c is equal to u into v by p very very important formula for ug question for viva question it could be a three they can give you some values and ask you to calculate the clearance or it could be a pg entrance question also so c is equal to u into v by p where u actually responds to the concentration of the particular substance it could be any substance which you want to measure it could be the concentration of substance in the urine p is the concentration of the substance in the plasma or the serum and v is the volume of urine which is being excreted per minute so you substitute these values and calculate the clearance of that particular substance so what e is equal to uv by p okay so that is actually the clearance and measurement of clearance is actually a predominantly a function of the glomerular filtration rate okay so it determines actually it is an indicator of gfr what's the normal gfr 120 to 125 ml per minute right or 180 liters per day very good okay so now uh, of course in if you remember the second slide we saw a lot of clearance test so similar the same thing you you have a lot of clearance test uh we can use inulin for clearance you can use uric acid you can actually use urea creatinine you can use diodrast and you can also use para amino hippuric acid but the most important thing which you have to remember here is that you have to use certain substances which will be completely filtered but neither reabsorbed nor secreted or choose such substances to do this clearance test that will actually give a clear indication of the gfr so the gfr will be equal to the clearance so if you take such way in that case inulin and uric acid are actually the two best substances to use for clearance test among these two if you ask one then it will be the inulin which is actually the best substance to actually do the clearance test because it is completely filtered neither reabsorb nor if you see the other things it be either filtered certain amount may be reabsorbed certain amount may be secreted but each one have of course they have their own uh, you know uh, advantages and disadvantages but the most common substance which is actually commonly used for during the clearance test is actually the inulin clearance test clear for everyone because it is completely filtered neither reabsorbed nor secreted clear can i move on to the next slide right so inulin clearance standard test which is actually used for measuring the gfr the pah clearance test determines a substance filtered and secreted but not reabsorbed so that means what do you think would it would be a good indicator of it is filtered it is secreted but not reabsorbed what can it be an indicator of it is an indicator of the renal plasma flow okay so this is a very very important viva question and a pg entrance question so which is a good indicator for renal plasma flow the answer would be ph clearance okay because it is completely filtered and secreted but not at all reabsorbed so what is the renal plasma flow normal value again a viva question the renal plasma flow is 700 ml per minute and gfr is 120 ml per minute so then if i divide 120 by 700 what do you call that term as filtration fraction so how much is the filtration fraction now roughly 120 by 700 1/5 exactly so 1/5 of the plasma 
that passes through the glomerulus becomes the glomerular filtrate and we call this as the filtration. Very, very important viva question. So what is the normal GFR? What is the normal renal plasma flow? What is filtration fraction? And all these definitions you should know. What is oliguria, anuria, polyuria? All right. So all these things in tips you should know because not just for your exam point of view, but tomorrow, next year, second year when you enter. So when you enter into your rounds, ward rounds, and when you are there actually looking at the patient's history and case sheets, you should know whether this is a normal report or a normal report. So for that, you should know the normal values. Clear? Right. Are there any blood investigations to do, I mean, to test the renal function test? Yes, of course. We have blood urea, blood creatinins, and serum electrolytes, which can also be done. Tubular function tests. So the simple tubular function test, which you can do, is actually the specific gravity of urine. What was the normal specific gravity? What was the range? 1.0052? What's the normal specific gravity? If I say one value, 10, 10. 1.010. Very good. Now, of course, we also have some special tests to also to do, you know, test your renal functions. We have ultrasound, we have intravenous pyelography, wherein we inject certain dyes, okay, and then we see the blood, I mean, flow particular dye through the kidneys. Then we have CT, MRI, and we can also go for renal biopsy if you suspect a renal malignancy, okay. So these are some of the special tests which can be done. Then coming to the clinical applications, we have something called acute renal failure and chronic renal failure. So acute renal failure means it's a failure which actually develops over a few days or over a few weeks. We call it as acute renal failure. If the same renal failure is going to happen over several years, then it becomes chronic renal failure. There are several reasons for acute renal failure and chronic renal failure. I'm not going into the details of all those things. Mostly these patients will present like this. They present with oliguria, kalemia, most important indication, hyperkalemia. Why is it so uh, important to treat hyperkalemia or is it not that important? It is important. Why? Very good. It can actually result in arrhythmias. Okay. So when you see hyperkalemia, the first thing we have to treat is hyperkalemia first. Okay. So that is very, very important. Of course, we will have dilutional hyponatremia, acidosis, hypocalcemia, edema, anemia, and uh, bleeding. All these things are given in your textbooks. I'm not going into the details, but... This is an important three marks question. How will you treat hyperkalemia? Or they can ask you, what is the physiological basis of giving insulin and glucose together for treating hyperkalemia? Have you come across this? Yes. What does insulin do? It pushes the potassium into the cells, thereby reducing the serum potassium levels. But to do this action, it actually requires the presence of... Sorry. When you give insulin, what happens to the glucose levels, basically? It comes down. So to treat that hypoglycemia, you actually compensate that by actually giving some glucose. So therefore, if you want to treat hyperkalemia, two important drugs have to be given together. You cannot just give insulin alone. Please remember that. Because if you give insulin alone, the patient is going to result in hypoglycemia. That becomes even more dangerous now. So therefore, when you give insulin, there are certain units of insulin which you have to give in certain that all those things are not needed for you. But at least you should know that you treat hyperkalemia by giving a combination of insulin and glucose together. That's a physiological basis. And of course, you because the patient will present with acidosis, you give sodium bicarb, treat all the fluid and electrolyte abnormalities. If there is an infection, treat the infection. And if required, if it is so dangerous, then you have to go for renal replacement therapy. So this is how you will treat acute renal failure. Clear for everyone? So basically... Is the cause. First, find out what is the cause for acute renal failure. If you treat the cause, most of these, uh, you know, symptoms will actually disappear. But the most important symptom which you have to be very careful of is actually hyperkalemia because that can actually result in dreadful arrhythmias and even take away the life of the patient. So you have to treat hyperkalemia immediately. Clear? Chronic renal failure, the same thing, almost the same. And uh, features also will be the same. I'm not going to the details. Again, the same principle applies. If it is most of the time the chron chronic renal failure, the most important reason is di diabetes mellitus and hypertension. So treat the diabetes mellitus, hypertension, anemia, fluid, electrolyte balance, metabolic acidosis. And if required, we have to go for renal replacement therapy. The last one for topic today is artificial kidney. 
what is artificial kidney dialysis yes so the dialyzer machine is actually called as the artificial and the process is actually called dialysis so basically it's a very simple process in dialysis what are we doing we are actually taking the patient's arterial blood and passing it through a machine so that machine is actually called as a dialyzer and what will this dialyzer do this dialyzer will take away all the unwanted substances like for example uric acid creatinine etc which are in very high concentration in the blood it will take away all these unwanted substances and it it will provide the important electrolytes which are actually missing in the patient's blood for example if the patient has low sodium it will give sodium if it is low in glucose it will infuse glucose and so on okay so removing all the unwanted or toxic substances from the blood and providing only the necessary substances or electrolytes into the blood that is actually the function of dialysis machine and after that what happens so once the blood gets purified that purified blood will once again be injected through the vein of the patient and the patient can So in the process of this dialysis the blood should not coagulate in any of this passage so therefore heparin is usually used as an anticoagulant that's all so this is the basic principle about dialysis so maybe i can show that in this picture so here you can see in this picture the patient is actually lying down you can see that from his um, i mean artery the blood is actually taken it is actually introduced into the hemofilter that is the dialyzer and once the blood gets purified and once again it is actually injected back to the patient so that is about dialysis clear and the basic principle behind dialysis is that it is basic simple diffusion movement of substances from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration so before doing the dialysis first of all you should know what are the different electrolyte abnormalities in the blood okay so you should know which all substances are actually high and which all substances are low and which all you have to infuse and which all you have to remove from the blood of the patient so that basic you know um, uh, do and accordingly you have to prepare the dialysate infusion for the patient so it is actually tailored for each and every patient it is not like you simply infuse the same pack for everyone it's not like that okay so you should be very very careful and frequent monitoring of electrolytes also should be done for such patients right so this is given in your textbooks so maybe you can just go through this picture so arterial blood from the patient number 1 enters through the dialyzer machine it enters into the dialyzer the dialyzer removes the way is from the blood by filtration and then the purified blood is returned back to the vein into the patient so this is about dialysis then we have something called peritoneal dialysis where within the peritoneum that is within the body of the patient itself we use the peritoneum as a filter that's all so that is actually here instead of using the dialysis machine they use a peritoneal dialysis so peritoneal membrane is used as a semi permeable membrane the catheter is inserted into the peritoneal cavity here you can see the catheter and it is sutured to the abdominal wall and the dialysate is then passed into the abdominal cavity that's it so what are the complications of dialysis complications of dialysis basically depends on the patient's condition whether the patient uh, i mean whether he is young or whether he is old whether he will be able to sustain the dialysis for how long he will be able to sustain so all those conditions existence of other comorbid conditions can also you know that will also determine the prognosis of dialysis and of course the common complications are sleep disorders and a lot of things going on in the patient's mind whether i will survive for how long i should go for dialysis is it lifelong process how much should i spend for each and every time when i go for dialysis so so many things running in the mind of the patient so this can actually cause a lot of anxiety and depression so of course in uh, government hospitals we do provide uh, dialysis free of cost but once they go for private hospitals it's really going to cost them a lot okay a single dialysis at, i mean sitting can actually cause them a lot so remember if they're going to have to undergo this dialysis for life long then it's really going to i mean the economic uh, burden which the patient has to bear is going to be very very high so this is in short about today's class so in today's class we have seen about what did we see about renal function test so we saw what all will come under the physical characteristics of urine we have seen the different characteristics of urine then we saw about acute and chronic renal failure and finally we saw one question about artificial kidney artificial kidney can come as a five mark question also come as a three mark question please draw the diagram okay it could be even a simple diagram it could be even a line diagram or whatever it is but draw the diagram of the artificial kidney and say that this is the principle behind which the artificial kidney works and give some indications for artificial kidney and what are the complications of artificial kidney that's all
Okay, so these are the questions you can expect. A lot of Viva questions can come from today's topic. Just learn small, small definitions of all the normal values which I have told you.